My father built our home. He framed the walls the right way, 16 inches on center, even though the code only called for 20. He laid the floors, real wood, in the downstairs rooms, carpet in the upstairs bedrooms, so when your feet touched the floor on the dark winter New England mornings, you didn't feel the chill, at least not right away. He covered the outside in cedar shingles, the type that start off looking crisp, golden brown, and aged to a dusty gray, the color fighting a losing battle to harsh weather and time. The windows are dormered and shuttered. The glass is the old style, where each window is made up of a dozen or so smaller square panes, painstakingly cocked and sealed against the elements. The home, by all accounts, is a masterwork. Every detail handcrafted to match the others, the true embodiment of a man providing for his family with his bare hands. Where I grew up, we had four seasons, and each one brought out a different face of the house. In the winter, the family room was always the warmest place. We used to heat with a wood stove. Sure, we had an oil burning furnace, but the thermostat was always set to warm enough, <laughs> as in warm enough to keep the pipes from freezing, but not much else. I remember as a kid waking up for school. Most days it was still dark. And even when the sun did come up, the light was nothing more than a half-hearted apology for the warmth it failed to provide. Some days, I swear I could see my breath as I slipped on my clothes, rushing to the sanctuary of that old iron stove. Rule one of winter at our house, don't let the stove go out. Rule two also happened to be, don't let the stove go out. <laughs> but considering the consequences for breaking rule one, rule two was rarely needed. In the spring, when you could finally break rule one, my mom used to open all the windows. They always resisted at first, the wood sticking to the frames as if the house was asking a question. Are you sure winter is over? When they finally relented, the cool spring air blew through and it felt as if the entire house was exhaling one long breath that it had been holding for the past six months. Summer was measured in fireflies. My sister and I would spend the warm nights catching them and putting them in jars next to our beds. Don't worry, we made sure to poke holes in the lids. I would fall asleep. Oh wait, to this day I am convinced fireflies are made of magic. I would fall asleep counting the soft silent flashes. Then at some point in the night, the magic would run out. And when I woke up, they would be nothing more than bugs in a mason jar. The metaphor of fireflies is a good metaphor for our house. There was indeed magic in that house, but it wasn't the good kind. The magic of our house wasn't in the details, what it looked like, or in how it sheltered us through the changing seasons. The magic of our house was how it could soak up all that happened within its walls and hide it from the rest of the world. Like the fireflies, eventually this magic too would run out. My father built our home. He built it with the only tools he had, fear, anger, and shame. He never hit us, at least not in the way his father hit him. Sometimes, thinking back on it, I lie to myself and say that it would have been easier that way, simpler to understand. But I know that's not true. Pain is just pain. The only difference is some scars you can lock away and others you can't. I've locked most of mine away, behind doors in the basin of my mind, some so deep that I can almost believe they happened to someone else, some character I read in a book years ago. My mom was the first to leave the house. She had her own demons, true enough, but they were no match for my father's. The news didn't come as a shock to me. Even at age 12, I understood that the current arrangement was unsustainable. The fighting had escalated to the point where it was easier to keep track of the moments when there wasn't screaming or crying or objects being thrown across rooms. My father's appetite for anger was insatiable and seemed to feed off itself. Walking on eggshells doesn't begin to describe the fear I felt. We all must have felt inside that house. Fighting back was not an option. His anger was like a tornado. It struck hard and fast with little or no warning, seemingly without cause or reason. If you happened to be in the path of the storm that day, all you could do was board up your emotions and hope he didn't find a chink in the armor. The slightest sign of weakness would be exploited. When the day finally came, 
for my mom to move out. She told my sister she was going to be living with her. I was supposed to go too, and I almost did. But at the last minute, I stood on the front porch of that house and said out loud, I'm staying with dad. I'll never forget the look on my mother's face. It wasn't shock. It was pity. But she had spent every ounce of her energy getting herself out, and in that moment, she had none left to save me too. She couldn't even muster the strength to ask me why. She just hung her head, turned, and left. To this day, I'm still not sure why I did it. Maybe I felt bad for him. Maybe I thought things would be different now that mom was gone. Maybe I was just 12, confused and scared of so much change. Years went by, just me, my father, and that house, that fucking house. It never got better, and in some ways it got worse. It wasn't that it escalated. It wasn't anything sexual. For all his fault, even my father had lines he wouldn't cross. It's just that as a guy I grew up, so too did my perspective. Is a caged bird really caged until it understands what's beyond its bars? That's what made it worse. The slow, steady understanding that it didn't have to be that way. That it wasn't normal for your father to cross a double yellow line drive head on at his son and wife, running them off the road because he told you to stay home and she was trying to take you to a friend's house. Or for him to leave his seat, storm out into the middle of your karate class in front of all the other parents, pushing other kids out of the way to pick you up over his shoulder, kicking and screaming, and carry you outside because he claimed you weren't paying attention and he was damn sure not going to raise a failure. That it wasn't normal to be forced into chopping wood two weeks after kidney surgery while you were still pissing blood. Real men don't take days off. Or to rip all the sparkle wires out of your car in a fit of rage, I honestly forgot what caused that reaction, but I do remember the cold walk to school that morning. Perhaps, most importantly, that it wasn't normal to solve every problem with anger, to control the people you were supposed to love with fear. They say it's only a fool who tries the same thing over and over and expects different results. I don't think I'm a fool, but no one will ever accuse me of not trying to make it work. The fact that I stayed as long as I did is proof that the dreams of what you want your parents to be can still trap you even if you're, after you're old enough to know better. And I have always been a dreamer. I was just shy of 18 the day I left, really left. It was late fall. The leaves had already turned from green through vibrant reds and yellows and were now just brown husks waiting for the winter wind to carry them away. I can still see myself standing in the driveway with my car packed. I had left as much as I could and I wish I could have left more. Maybe someday I will. Before I drove away, I took a moment to look back at the house. It really is a work of art. I knew in that moment it wasn't going to be the last time I'd be there, but I also knew from then on I would always see the house for what it was and not what it promised to be. My father built our house. He built it with his bare hands and destroyed it just the same. To this day, I still go back. Family is funny like that. My father is old now. I think time and loneliness has eroded his sharper edges. He still tries to cut from time to time, but there's no force behind it anymore. It's sad in a way, like watching an old dog fetch. The will is there, but you can tell he's only good for a few throws. The house is old too, but its record is flawless. Walking back into it, I can still taste the anger. Like cigarette smoke, it's soaked into the walls. It covers every surface. My eyes are drawn to a thousand tiny scars that tell the real story. The nick in the countertop where the butter dish shattered, mom's aim was off that day. The spot of paint that doesn't quite match the rest of the wall, I massage the scar in my right hand that does match it. Anyone else would just see a beautiful house, would marvel at the craftsmanship and attention to detail, and that, to me, is still magic. The thing is, I don't mind it anymore. In fact, I like going back. Call me crazy, mumble Stockholm Syndrome under your breath. I don't blame you, and maybe I am. I look forward to going back, to the house because for everything it hid from the world, that house showed me something too. It showed me how to be a better person. It gave me the roadmap for what not to do and I have followed it ever since. I own the house now. Well, me and my sisters do. 
My father is still alive, but he set it up that way. I like to think he did it because deep down inside, he believes that house is the only thing he did right for his family. I'd happily watch it burn to the ground in exchange for a childhood of love and support, if only the world worked that way. But time moves forward, and everything that once was new becomes old, and everything that becomes old eventually fades away. So I know one day I will get the call. Some of you in this room have already gotten this call. Only the person on the other end won't say something like, I'm so sorry, but your father has passed. They will tell me something like, I'm so sorry, but your father has vanished and we have no idea where he went. But I'll just smile because I'll know exactly where he went. My father loves that house. He poured everything of himself into that house, the good and the bad, piece by piece, day by day, year by year, he gave himself to that house. One day, the house will take the last piece. One day, he will simply become the thing he loves most in this world. One day, I'll drive up the street. It'll be a cold winter afternoon. I'm sure of it. I'll park my car and walk through the door. The house will be empty, but it will greet me as it always does. After all, I put my time in and it knows. I'll sit in the recliner by the old iron stove and it'll still be warm because my father would never break rule number one. Give it up for Vamp first timer, Joe Bastoni.